Great. That was easier than expected. Um, oh, so I don't have to be here then. No. <laughs> um, great. So I will just introduce uh, Dick. Um, I work with Dick on Nantucket. He's a mentor of mine. Um, we did a lot of songbird banding together. Um, but he is a seabird ecologist and ornithologist based at the College of Staten Island, um, City University of New York. And there he teaches ecology, animal behavior, mathematical biology, and ornithology. His most recent work is on the process of vagrancy, which is a misnomer for the exploratory behavior of typical, um, typical of all organisms or virtually all organisms, especially birds, and how this exploration changes with population growth that in turn may be related to changing climate or environmental changes in general. He serves on the board of directors of New York City Audubon Society and was formerly the United States rep for the ICES Working Group on Seabird Ecology. And tonight he's going to be talking about his work on vagrancy and more specifically his recent project with lesser black backles on Nantucket. So with that, Dick, I will hand it off to you and get started whenever you're ready. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I, it's not obvious how to advance among the slides when I'm in full screen like this. Okay. Um, if I stop share, well, I could do it this way. Huh? This is bizarre. Okay, so I go to the first slide, right? I'm on the first slide. Mm -hmm. And then is there more than one from beginning? There, okay. No, I don't. Okay, let's try let's try this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, just hit uh share screen again and then we should be able to see your slideshow. You still see it? Yep, perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks again, Shay. I'm glad to be here. This this is the first, um, or let me backtrack a minute. This has been a long and painful experience. Of, I first talked about doing this maybe six or seven years ago, and we had various stumbling blocks, and then COVID hit, and then the Ukraine war hit, and um, it's been an effort and, and not but not least it took us a lot longer than we thought to figure out how to catch these birds um if you're familiar with low beach on nantucket you could sort of go out there anytime and they're like pigeons in the surf and uh you think you just chuck a bunch of mussels and or scallops and they come right in and you catch them well it, it doesn't work that way mm -hmm. um, as we found out but this is a I'm particularly interested in lesser black back gulls, not just because they're cool birds and they're on Nantucket, but um, I've been generally interested for a long time now, probably at least 30 years in the, um, the idea of vagrancy, particularly in birds, obviously, but uh, other things as well. And it's always struck me as very odd that, um, Going, going back into the 1950s and continuing, there's this notion that um, vagrants are something, you know, they're, you know, birds are supposed to do this migration, which looks like they go up and down I-95 each year and uh, they breed on one end and winter on the other end. And that's that. And every time a bird does something different than that, it's so oh, oh my god what's wrong with this bird it must be genetically defective it must have gotten blown by a storm and <clears throat> so on and so on and it uh 
there were there were many famous statements to the effect that um, vagrant birds are very interesting, but they're of no biological significance, uh, whatever. And I want to persuade you that that is certainly not true. And um, the, the quantitative study of vagrancy by birds is especially important now as the climate and the rest of the earth changes. So um, lesser blackback gulls are gulls in general. I, I work mostly with seabirds and gulls are kind of easy to work with. I mean, compared to you know, nocturnal storm petrels that nest on offshore islands and are difficult to get to and so forth. Um, I, I, people might laugh when I say gulls are easy to work with following our, our uh, production this past uh, couple of months, but they are, and they're accessible, they're common, and these lesser blackback gulls and specifically are clearly doing something different and interesting. Just because you're on Martha's Vineyard, or at least some of you are, I want to start right out by, I'm going to show you a bunch of um, images of our tracking data. And this is the last three days of one bird <clears throat> that's been spending a whole bunch of time on Martha's Vineyard. And I'm just showing you this as a teaser to um, uh, encourage you to keep an eye out for it. and. Um, Here's, uh, you know, here's Cape Pogue here, and here's Edgar Town, and uh, I, I, this is called Katama Bay, I think, is, but whatever, this is where the bird's been spending most of its time. But all of these slides I'm showing you are going to be of a single bird, and this is a single bird over three days, and I'll, I'll show you uh, another picture of this later on with the data summed over um, 20 days, but a, a high proportion of the time by this bird is spent here in Katama Bay. So uh, if you want to go out there and take a look for it, this bird is in third winter plumage. So it looks basically like an adult, <clears throat> but it's got um, a blackish uh, center to the end of the tail and some brownish wing covered. So it's mostly an adult looking uh, with, with brownish edges on some of the feathers, but it should be very recognizable. They have an antenna sticking out of their back, and I'll show you pictures, and a bright red color band with two white letters on it. But I've uh, noticed just by the way that this bird over three days, it's covering, you know, a good part of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. So they're um, even to me, who's been looking at satellite tracking data for 20 or 30 years and uh, trying to uh, make sense out of it, this this alone is a lot farther than I thought um, these birds would be moving. Uh, particularly saying, you know, if you go out to Low Beach or Great Point, they're always there in, in the winter and they, it, it, they give the appearance of being sort of sedentary and clearly they're not. Okay. That that was a that was a forward look at the lesser blackback gulls. Now I want to say something about why we're bothering to study this. We got a substantial grant from National Science Foundation to do this, who um, are not especially interested in birds. They, it's the uh, Division of Environmental Biology. They they fund anything that has anything to do with the environment, but they were very excited about this proposal and. Um, I'm going to try and persuade you that we're, there's a good reason for that. So I want, first, I want to talk about what vagrancy is, and I'm going to show uh, a few examples from a, a analyses that we've done recently. And, and many of these are with my colleague, Lisa Manna, and also a former student, uh, Lucinda Zawadzki. But this is uh, a tropical kingbird, and I picked this one because we saw one on Staten Island a couple of years ago. <clears throat> The point I want to make here is this is number of tropical kingbirds on this axis. This is year from 1985 to 2020. The light line is birds in Florida. The dark line is birds in the Northeast, which is, uh, I think, from Delaware north to uh, Quebec. And what I want you to see is the close correspondence between these two curves. 
the um, I'm not suggesting that these birds in Florida are the same ones that later come up to the Northeast, but rather that the, the very uh, considerable similarity between the increasing slopes of these curves is because it's part of the same process, namely population growth by tropical kingbirds. And this is a statistical analysis of the same, showing that the number in the Northeast is significantly predict, predicted by the number in Florida. They're occurring in the same years at the same seasons, but in very different places. <clears throat> this in itself suggests a population level process. Rather, that most people talk about vagrants in terms of their individuals. Oh, well, that one got caught up in a storm. Oh, that one is a reverse migrant, or that, that's uh, got genetic problems with its orientation or something like that. To the con on the contrary, this seems to be a general thing that is going on um, with tropical kingbirds, which, which is northward range expansion. A lot of the stuff about attempting to explain vagrancy has to do with compass orientation and distance travel. And the you know, if a uh, um, wheat ear shows up in Newfoundland, the idea is well, the, those wheat ears normally follow a course of. Um, three five two during spring migration and you know 123 during fall migration wait a minute <clears throat> um and that this applies to the mirror image misorientation stuff that um the author of whom dumped this idea 25 years ago but it still comes up in all the latest books on vagrancy um the claim in that instance is that birds they have a migratory orientation and they orient 90 degrees to the east or to the west of that because their their genetics are bad. But wait a minute. <clears throat> Here are some data on migratory orientations, and these are taken from garden warblers. I think these are garden warblers. Yeah, in uh, Western Europe, this is one of the classic studies in the 70s. There have been hundreds and hundreds of studies like this that do the same thing. Birds are put in these, uh, um, they're in, either inside planetariums or outside in the night sky, and they're in a cylindrical cage, and they there's an ink pad at the bottom, and they by based, uh, based on where their footprints are, they can tell which way the birds are oriented. There isn't any such thing as an orientation direction for a, a bird. There, there, are, there is a mean orient. Each one of these is a single bird, each one of these little marks. There is a mean orientation. <clears throat> these are birds nesting in different areas. But there's a huge spread in migratory orientations among different individuals. This is true of all birds. So when a bird shows up in the place you don't expect it to be, you don't have to postulate that there's something wrong with that bird. It's just flying in a different direction from where most of them go. Similarly, there is a huge variability, and this is a lot harder, harder to measure, in distances traveled by migratory birds. So what is a vagrant? It's one that's gone an awful long distance so on top of other things. But, um, and you can imagine these data are difficult to collect or used to be before satellite tracking. But uh, these are data on banded ring billed gulls. And, and I picked ring billed gulls. Actually, Lisa Manna put this uh, graph together uh, because you could go on ring billed gull colonies and ban thousands of birds and then stand some chance of getting a reasonable sample of. Um, retraps. Now think about this. You banned a bunch of ring-billed gulls on one of the Great Lakes, and how many do you think you're going to get recaptured? They're going to spread out over the whole southeast United States from Texas, Texas to you know, New York or wherever. Um, what's the chance that they die? What's the chance that someone picks, it, picks them up and then decides to send the band in? But given that, look at the spread of distances. The the um, 
the distribution of dispersal distances, by the way, always looks like this. It's what, what's called a fat-tailed distribution because it's very skewed in the long distance direction. But, you know, most ring build gulls are going, what, 200 kilometers, uh, sorry, 200 miles, but they're individuals that are going 10 or 15 times that far. And this is ordinarily, this is a small, sample of birds compared to um, you know the, the total population of ring-billed gulls but what this shows is some individuals go very much farther than the rest ordinarily that's to be expected <clears throat> this might seem a little bit off the wall but um, what i'm going to talk about with lesser blackback gulls is what we call exploratory behavior and in a nutshell i would say that what we think of as migration, and I, I can't tell you how sick and annoyed I am of all these, you've seen these National Geographic things with these straight lines going up and down, showing the flyways as if it's, you know, Route 95 that all the birds follow, and then they all come back and follow the other way. Their migration is nothing like that. <clears throat> and this is, um, you don't know the need to know the math here, but this is something called a uh, this is movement of an individual. This is an insect. Um, and there, there are various reasons why we want to uh, quantify that movement. And you can see this bug is sort of flying along in a very bug-like bug way. And incidentally, this looks a lot like the track followed, more like the track followed by a migratory bird than the, the sort of standard illustrations you see. But if you want to um, measure how exploratory something is, what you can do is fit a number of straight lines to that path up there and then um, measure the angles of all the turns. So here, this bug started out here, it took a left. You can measure that angle. It took a right and then took another right and, and so on. And you can measure the correlation among the angles of those turns. And if, if the insect or bird is going in a straight line, that will, the angles will all be about the same, namely zero. So you'll have very high correlation, a very correlated pattern. Whereas if they're doing a zigzag stuff like this, it will be un less correlated. So that's a way to quantify um, the kind of behavior that birds are following. And I want you to keep that idea in mind when I show you these maps of lesser black bat gulls. So uh, a, a windy path like this suggests that searching for something as opposed to a bird just going which uh, might imply sort of a, a commonly held view of migration. I said this at the beginning, vagrancy is important now because of changes in land use and climate. The, we recently published a paper about, uh, um, we said something like vagrancy uh, escaped from extinction. <clears throat> a lot of organisms are gonna go extinct over the next few hundred years. And the ones that don't might avoid extinction because they're sending out vagrants that discover uh, places that are newly suitable. It didn't used to be suitable. Think about yellow-throated warblers moving up the coast of North America or something like that. The other thing I've um, already said, but I will probably say it five or six different ways through the talk, vagrancy is normal and not an aberration or mistake. And what I mean by that, this is part of the ordinary life history of birds and all other organisms. It's usually done um, by young individuals, but not always. <clears throat> um, and the reason that I'm going to argue that uh, vagrancy is characteristic of growing populations is because growing populations are producing lots of young birds and as I just said, young birds are the ones that do most of the dispersal. So if you've got a population producing lots of babies and they pick up and they take off, you get an increasing number of vagrants at places distance, distant from the source. Some quick examples, and 
uh, I'm getting back to lesser blackback gulls in a minute, but I just wanted to show you where we're going with this data. Here's a white winged dove. I'm sure you've had some of those on Martha's Vineyard. <clears throat> Here is the breeding bird survey of the range of nesting white winged doves in North America up to, this is probably about 2015. The colors have to do with whether a population, the population is growing or shrinking. And blue is growing population, red is shrinking. So over much of the southwestern United States, there's a substantial growth in the population of white winged doves. Whoops. Here's an eBird map. This is all, I've just asked eBird for all records of white winged doves in. I, I just did it for the whole world, all records of white winged doves between 1960 and 1970. And you can see this roughly corresponds to South Texas getting over into Arizona, New Mexico. There's one in California that's a vagrant. Um, here's one in the Mississippi Valley. There's some in Florida, but generally not that much different from uh, the breeding range. I'll figure out the right arrows. Uh, between 1980 and 1990, there's a lot more spread. There, there are more sightings along the, um, the south coast here, um, still plenty in the breeding range, but there's much more distant vagrants in Maine, Nova Scotia, uh, up around Lake Superior. I think there's one even up in um, northern British Columbia during this time period. There's one in Oregon. So what's going on here? Again, po the populations are growing. And incidentally, this does, this does not have to do with increasing numbers of birders. I mean, that, that, is, that is a factor, but um, we've done analyses that factor that out. And the, the growth here is far in excess of what could be explained by increasing numbers of birders and, and eBird and everything else. Um, anyway, so... The population is growing, but as it's growing, it's generating individuals that are going much farther than the other ones. 2010 to 2018, they are all over the place. Um, the, e, these eBird maps are a little bit mis misleading because they're not abundance maps. So in other words, the dark square, a dark square could be five birds, it could be 500. It's, it's not quantitative in that way. It's the color of the squares is how many eBird checklists were submitted for that species in that place. But nevertheless, there's a huge increase in the spread. Um, they're, breed, they're both extending their breeding range north and sending vagrants much farther out. This one actually has one that's way off the chart up in uh, uh, southern Alaska. Similarly, scissor-tailed flycatchers, I want to illustrate another point here. Scissor-tailed flycatchers are um, decreasing in North America. Any, any estimate of population, there are lots of them. They're easily censused. Everyone knows how to identify them. There are a lot of data on scissor-tailed flycatchers. But all estimates of trend show that the the trend of the entire world population, which is basically right there, is declining. Yet there's an increasing number of vagrants. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> what I would argue here is on the western edge of the range and the eastern edge of the range, the population is actually increasing. The, there are relatively few individuals here, but they're growing fast. So these are places where uh, young birds are pre being produced, and those are the ones that are dispersing. And I've just got two maps. I, can, I think this is 1970 to 1980, but what I want you to see is the increase here to uh, 2008 to 2018. And they're, interestingly, they're going in, in both directions. They're uh, increasing in frequency on the West Coast and the East Coast here. With with a with a it does seem there's a predominance of eastward movement compared to westward movement, but in any case, they're spreading out over a wide area. 
I already the increases do not simply simply represent increased effort. Uh, rather, they are a consequence of population growth and movement by mostly young birds. Um, there is I'm coming up on a paper that uh, uh, my colleague Lucinda Zawadzki uh, uh, worked on as a, a thesis here that goes through endless, very rigorous st uh, statistical analyses demonstrating these points. And I'm happy to send that to anyone or any of the other papers I mentioned here. Just email me if you want. Um, birds explore. A guy named Robin Baker wrote this. It's like a 1500 page tome on um, what we're talking about here. And he actually um, uh, cal calculated a, a rather complex model of um, dispersal. He didn't call it vagrancy, but he's clearly talking about the same thing. And he uh, makes a lot of the same points that. <clears throat> There we go, excuse me. So exploratory behavior, I've said something about it. This is a map of roseate tern migration. Uh, Carolyn Mostello and Ian Nisbet worked on this and, and I helped them. Um, but they put geolocators. Geolocators are relatively imprecise uh measurers of a bird's position and they're i mean they're much less precise than the um ptt's that i'm going to show you in the lesser blackback goes but nevertheless look at this um roseate turn going north in the spring now what's happening in the spring Ro you know this, this is a bird heading up to a nesting colony what do birds do in spring migration they go as fast as they can directly to the colony because they have to start breeding so is this going as fast as you can towards the colony? No, this is, uh, and Ian saw this and he said, oh, well, geolocators are unreliable. Well, they, they are rather imprecise, but there's no way that this bird went in a straight line and generated this, this circuitous path. And this is, here's Cape Hatteras. This is the Gulf Stream area. And I suspect what's going on is that um, this bird is, uh, following schools of dolphins. That's a, a whole Gulf Stream is a very uh, productive feeding area. And what this implies is some kind of exploration to find find more food in, in, the, in the course of getting ready to breed up there at Bird Island in Massachusetts. Yeah, this is... Um, Lucinda, who was a student here at CUNY and went on and got her PhD at Oxford working on uh, population growth and vagrancy of lesser blackback gulls, of all things, uh, wrote this paper with us. And I'm not going to go through it, but it's got very thorough and elaborate uh, statistical analysis of population growth and increase of vagrancy by ash throated flycatchers. You might be noticing the White winged dove, ash throated flycatcher, uh, um, scissor tail flycatcher, those are all southwestern birds. And indeed, there are a um, combination of changes in both temperature and rainfall in the southwest that um, figuring out the precise details of exactly how that leads to more baby ash throated flycatchers being produced. Um, the jury's out on that, but nevertheless, um, we, we used a four different substantial data sets to support the notion that the reason for the increase of ash throated flycatchers on the East Coast is enhanced reproductive success within the Southwest part of their range. And they've extended their breeding range considerably north and east from the previous core in uh, about in central Arizona. Okay, 
that up to the uh, subject of the real talk here, lesser black back gulls, you all know what these look like, I'm sure. Here, This is actually taken in Europe, but just for a comparison of herring gull and lesser black back gulls, you can see their bright orange legs there. Um, you can't see it that well in here, but the, uh, the wings are longer, so they have a real pointy looking rear end. And of course, the uh, slaty uh, mantle color darker from uh, herring gulls. Here is the, um, this is taken from Birds of the World, uh, the a recent but not recent enough range map of lesser blackback gulls. They're mainly a um, Northwestern European species. And in fact, the, the lesser blackback gulls we're talking about are the subspecies called uh, Grailsii, which is found mainly in uh, Great Britain, uh, Germany, and the Netherlands, and very southern Scandinavia. So it's basically native to this area. They winter in West Africa. They colonized Iceland during the 1920s. They're now they're they're like pigeons around Reykjavik in Iceland. It's it's unbelievable how abundant they are. And then they colonized West Greenland here in uh, the 1980s. There are now about 3,000 pairs at the minimum nesting along the southwestern coast of Greenland. People have been talking about lesser blackback gulls. There are so many in North America, well, on the North American coast. They've got to be nesting here. Well, I don't see any evidence of that. You know, aside from the fact that there are a lot here in the winter, um, uh, it's not logical to me that just because there are a lot here in the winter, they must be nesting in North America. But I, I get asked that all the time. I think the birds on Nantucket are all coming from this uh, West Greenland population. And one of the th it's not the main um, gist of our work, but one of the things that we want to do is substantiate the idea that that's where these, these guys are breeding. So even though this is the recent map from uh, Birds of the World, um, you know, they they haven't incorporated this uh, the, this data on Southwest Greenland. <clears throat> Here's an eBird map, and this is sort of more up to date, even though it's somewhat less quantitative. But these th think about exploratory behavior and and wandering around. M many of these are uh, from different subspecies of lesser blackback gulls, but uh, virtually all of these are of Grailsia. They've made it up to uh, southern Alaska. There are um, many records on the west coast of North America. They've attempted to breed in Alaska. There are some records along the Labrador coast here, but nothing suggestive of breeding yet. And then here are the um, uh, west coast of Greenland uh, uh, nesting birds. Plus, I don't think they're nesting anywhere anywhere near this far north, but there are birds getting getting well up there. So a, a lot of our question is, how do they do this? If if a lesser blackback gull is, is genetically determined, say, say you're a lesser blackback gull in Iceland and you winter in, in um, France or, or wherever, um, and you and you fly back and forth like this every year, how on earth do you get over here? It has, and this is not just one or two birds. This is now there are three or four thousand birds wintering in eastern North America. They've got to be doing something sometime during their life, during the span of their life, to be able to find places like this. And you know, the, this kind of regular migration does not allow in any way for that. And it's got to be a substantial number of birds. This isn't just one that gets caught in a hurricane or um, one bird that's genetically defective. This is a population level process of exploration and colonization. Lucinda, as I mentioned, she was a uh, PhD student at uh, Oxford, and she just finished recently and published this paper. And I'm going to take um, one figure from that. Before, I'm going to show you some satellite tracking data, also not our satellite tracking data, but um, why do we think that the birds in North America, um, the ones in Nantucket and elsewhere on the East Coast, are coming from England? 
Well, these three graphs are um, comparing the, the dark line here where the black circles are CBC Christmas bird count totals for the US East Coast. And it's the same in all of the graphs. So it's um, it began accelerating maybe the late 1990s and 2005 or so. It really started to go through the roof. And it's the same curve on every one of these. The upper left one that we're comparing CBC numbers in North America to breeding population in the United Kingdom. Now, you might know that when they count gulls in the United Kingdom, they do it very, very thoroughly. <laughs> if, if you think our breeding bird surveys are impressive, take a look at what the Brits do on this. But they have very precise data on the population size of lesser black bat gulls. And our point here is, look, look, they peaked in about um, the mid 1990s and have steadily declined since then. So the notion that these are generating a lot of young birds that are coming up over to North America is very unlikely. Now, <clears throat> people have pointed out was what, well, adult birds occur as vagrants too. Yes, they do, but far less frequently than young birds. The, the overwhelming majority of long distance vagrants are young birds. So it seems very unlikely that um, birds from England are coming over here. <clears throat> Same thing, is is kind of true for Iceland. They got there in about 1980. They reached a peak in around 2000, maybe 2005. Uh, the data aren't quite as good from there, but it is clear that um, Iceland lesser black bat gulls have been steadily decreasing since about 2005. The data from Greenland, which are surprisingly are a bit better than the data from Iceland, probably because it's a recent colonist and the, the local ornithologists are particularly interested. But um, the, the trajectory is, and we, or Lucinda spent a lot of time talking with the people who did these censuses and it's, um, the, the, the censuses are nowhere near as good as they are in the UK, for example. But nevertheless, there is a steadily increasing population in um, Greenland. And this is a, uh, a statistical fit line here, which suggests they're continuing to grow. So if you ask the question, what population of lesser black bat gulls seems most likely to be producing all the uh, vagrants in North America? It looks mostly like uh, birds from Greenland <clears throat> and not mainland Europe or Iceland. Well, why aren't they breeding in North America? Well, there's no evidence that they are. And, and people say, well, there are a lot of open areas in Arctic Canada. Yeah, but there are lots of aerial surveys and um, uh, um, other kinds of surveys. And it, it's a big area, but it, Canadian Wildlife Service does quite a lot up there. And if, if there were one pair, sure, that could be overlooked. But I think it's very unlikely there are substantial gull colonies. They're, they're quite uh, uh, conspicuous. Coincidentally, believe it or not, I was my former PhD student, who many of you might know, Sean Murphy, who worked on oyster catchers on Nantucket. And I think he, he even ventured as far as the vineyard uh, when he, when he was working on this in the mid 2000s. He's now the Pennsylvania State Ornithologist and he just moved there maybe five years ago. And his colleagues there had coincidentally got that, they, they work mostly with deer and they've got a cannon net for catching deer. And somehow they got the notion, why don't we go catch some lesser black bat gulls and put some transmitters on them? And they were in um, Lake Nakamixon, which is in, it's near Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, has massive numbers of lesser black bat gulls. There were about 600 on a reservoir there last month and one reservoir in Western New Jersey. But they caught nine birds, put satellite track transmitters, and this is the results from the, the their data. The, this, this, is, this has not been published yet, but... Um, 
he shared the slide with me. And in a nutshell, one bird did go to Baffin Island, but it didn't hang around there. It just, it just showed up, and, and um, I think they might have lost track of it at that point. <clears throat> but seven of the nine birds, I think I have it right, all went up to Western Greenland and spent substantial time there. Um, the, the, there was also this weirdo here, but think about exploratory behavior. What's going on here? This is um, this is several hundred miles out into the central Atlantic here. Um, this is not just they saw a fishing boat on the horizon and went after it. This is serious exploration. But um, I, I take this as, as strong further support that, in fact, these uh, birds at Nantucket are and elsewhere on the East Coast are nesting in West Greenland. So our project, we we had lots of lots of delays, and I won't bore you with all the details of that. But when we finally got going, I sort of figured, you know, that this will be a piece of cake to. Uh, go out and catch these birds. And I contacted Larry Niles, who uh, some of you might know because he's he's been working with people on uh, Monomoy, uh, catching red knots, and I think also turns. He's the only person now working on the East Coast who has a banding permit to fire a cannon net as opposed to a rocket net. Um, which is perfect for catching gulls. He's never used it for gulls before. He does mostly shorebirds, but he's caught laughing gulls and uh, common terns and things like that. But I wrote to him whenever three years ago and said, hey, we, we need to catch some lesser blackback gulls. And you, you think about trying to catch gulls, if, if you go out and catch one at a time, you know, no matter how you do it, you go out to a beach and catch one gull, it's going to make a big mess and everyone's going to squawk and you'll probably spook the rest of the gulls off. So um, I figured you kind of have to catch a whole bunch at once because um, you're not going to get another chance. So I asked him about the cannon net and I'll just what I'm showing you here is the, the basic procedure out the out there. We used about 400 pounds of frozen herring that I got up in Gloucester. And um, I don't know, not as much, but, um, you know, three big like bushel barrels of scallop guts. And over a num number of times, we uh, poured those out on the beach here and then set up the cannon net. This is... Uh, uh, Mandy Niles. This is uh, Larry's wife, and and the two of them work together. Here's all our. It took us two pickup loads of equipment to do this. By the way, here is, she's cautioning everyone about not walking in front of the net because if you get hit by the projectile, it would probably kill you. So you have to be careful not to do that. Here's here's Larry, and here, here this is the cannon net right here. It's uh. So it's a uh, 70 feet long or something like that. <clears throat> you could probably catch easily about 50 gulls if you wanted to, but it's got, this is one of the cannons. There are four of these. Each has an iron projectile. It has black gunpowder. It's attached to the front of the net. It, uh, this is Lisa Mana here. That's Yvonne v uh, Valencor from the UMass field station. So if you can't see the net, it's because we've worked hard to camouflage it. It's um, the birds are really spooked by it at first. I mean, just seeing it there, but the, it's sitting. To, you, you can barely see it. It's covered with sand. Oh, here it is, right here. It's running along here, and with we push up the ridge of sand so it's not visible. There's the bait below there. Here's the bunch of us. Here is a young bird in the hand. It's got a, a sock over its head just to prevent it from biting. Uh, I'm holding the bird. Lisa is attaching the um, MTI uh, micro tele micro microwave telemetry is the company name that makes these uh, PTTs. They're solar charged. Uh, they weigh, the, the ones we use weigh 18 grams. So it's easily carried by a lesser blackback gull. 
Um, this is what it looks like in the hands, the red and white color band. The um, transmitter sits on the back here. There is a harness that wraps around the neck and under the wings. And there's uh, all the four pieces of the harness are tied together here on the chest right above the sternum. And there's a weak link there. And in two or three years, that weak link will break and the whole thing will fall off the bird. We were fortunate on this in that um, people in uh, Western Europe and the UK have been doing this with lesser blackback gulls for about 20 years and they've worked out all the bugs. So um, I've done a bit of um, transmittering birds before and these worked by far the best of any I've seen. The, the, Often when you put a harness on a bird and let it go, it sort of flops around, drops, and it shakes itself out. When we released these birds, they just whoosh, sailed off as if not, nothing was the matter. And uh, the, their actions so far suggest there um, is not a big deal. Okay, I'm going to launch into data. And... Um, what I want you to think about is, the, is this is the this is winter, right? We put one transmitter on on the 18th of January and 14 out on the 8th and 9th of February. So this is winter. So the, these are winter movements by birds that um, I mean, I, I'm not going to say an awful lot because this is obviously the first time we've tried this here, but we're from everything we know that we're not looking at migratory behavior here. This is just um, foraging and exploring during winter residence. And I'm gonna I'm gonna show you 14 birds, I think. Each one of these pictures is for 20 days ending about three days ago. Each one is a single bird. So this is the this one um Right after we tagged it, within 12 hours, it flew from Nantucket to the Hudson Canyon, about 100 miles off uh, New York, um, flew up to Fire Island, New York, flew west along the south side of Long Island to Brooklyn, turned around, wouldn't you, and go back out and went back out to about Meacox Bay on Long Island, flew back to Staten Island, and it's been there ever since. And well, I see it seems to be based on Staten Island and it's uh, it's wandering around to these various reservoirs in New Jersey and garbage dumps. It went just this is a couple of days ago. It went down to uh, uh, I can't remember what inlet that is in New Jersey here that this bird was on Staten Island within a mile of my house for like a month. And myself and uh, Jose Ramirez went out multiple times we'd we'd see where the set tracker said it was we went out and we could not find it to save our life and finally about three or four days ago it landed in this um uh recovered wetland nearby here and i went running down there and there's this elderly woman throwing french bread and stuff out on the ground with a whole bunch of gulls around and there it was so this this is a first year bird juvenile there, there's the tran there's the um, antenna there, <clears throat> uh, a red band with with uh, white letters. It's also got a Fish and Wildlife Service band on it. Here's another one. So this is one bird, and you, you'll notice from these pictures, there's a couple of different patterns here. There was a we there are fourteen of them out there, maybe six or eight just spent their whole time on Nantucket doing this. this. This is over a 20-day period ending a few days ago. Um, they On Nantucket, they tend to favor Great Point, Low Beach, and they go into the harbor quite a bit, and there's a, they're, they're over the inland part of Nantucket surprisingly frequently. <clears throat> this is Blair Perkins and uh, Rain Harbison uh, have been surveying the beach out there almost daily to find seal pups, and they've, they've been a lot of help to us and have photographed a few. This is a second winter bird uh, up near Great Point. There you can see the antenna and, and barely pick up the uh, red and white uh, leg band. There, um, so there are two groups. I said one group is pretty much staying on Nantucket. There's a second group that 
hightailed it out of Nantucket pretty much immediately after we put the tags on and went down to the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area and stayed there the whole time. This is a big area for lesser blackback gulls. It's sort of puzzling. What are they doing in Nantucket in the first week of February if they're spending the winter here? I, I think the basic idea is that um, these these gulls engage in a process of exploration um, throughout the winter. Now, the the one that I just showed you, not not one that this one, this was born in hatched in June 2022. It it took off from Nantucket and made a beeline just about for Staten Island, and then went to a garbage dump in Pennsylvania. How did it know it was there? Well, maybe it didn't know it was there. It was following other birds. But I, I, hatching in July, it could have easily made it down to Nantucket by August or September, and then on down to New Jersey area um, earlier in the fall. And I'm suspecting it had been there before, so, so knew where these uh, sources of food were. Um, so this, this is out... Uh, uh, around centered around um, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. There's an open garbage dump there, and um, there are the uh, Spruce Run Reservoir in New Jersey had 600 lesser blackback gulls on it in late January, and uh, Lake Nakamixon, which you can't it's 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 here. It's um, 20 minutes drive away from uh, Spruce Run Reservoir. Also have a large bunch, so that's a major area for wintering lesser blackback gulls. <laughs> Here's another, here this bird is taking a number of separate trips out for, this is the shipping, shipping channel um, east of all the shoals and west of George's Bank. And this is 40 miles plus. So I mean, this isn't just a, a case of a bird seeing a boat on the horizon and going out there. It's, it's actively foraging offshore. Lesser blackback gulls are known to be more pelagic than herring gulls, for example. So um, they, they might actively explore those areas, but they might also have experience of uh, fishing trawlers. Here is our uh, champion exploratory lesser blackback gull. Again, this is over a 20 day period. Here's Montauk Point, here's Block Island, Nantucket and the Vineyard. This is the continental slope here. This is uh, Hydrographer Canyons right over here. This is Veach's Canyon. This is uh, uh, Al Alvin Canyon and Alvin, Alvin and Atlantis Canyon. And th this bird is going right out to the continental slope. Um, you, you might have been on trips out to Hydrographer Canyon, which is just off the slide here. I'll bet you didn't see many gulls out there. I've only been on the out by the continental slope a couple times in winter. And um, it was back in the 1970s when the factory fleets were there. And there are quite a lot of great black back gulls there then. But my, and I asked Brian Pattison, who gets out to the, into the Gulf Stream a lot in midwinter. He, he says he doesn't see many gulls, but there are some. But um, this surprised me. And, um, the this is just one bird, but it's it seems to be making a point of coming out on repeated voyages and visiting this area. I'd be very curious to know what they're feeding on. There could be commercial fishing fishing out here. Um, they could also be uh, there are a number of species of dolphins in this area that uh, herd. Uh, fish to the surface, and they might be benefiting from that. Again, lesser blackbacks are notoriously pelagic, so in that, in that sense, this is um, not that surprising. This is one that pretty much, this is, uh, that's Cape May, New Jersey. This is Cape Henlope and Delaware. This one pretty made, pretty much made a beeline all the way to here a month ago, and, they, and it's been um, spending the whole time here. There's a garbage dump right in the center of this area. 
another Nantucket resident, but note these, this is going well out onto the Nantucket Shoals, so it's quite clearly pelagic foraging, possibly following trawlers, but um, also quite possibly after uh, natural food. This is what I showed you from the vineyard earlier on, <clears throat> and this is what I showed you earlier was just three days. This is for 20 days, and the there, it was very focused on Katama Bay, but despite that, did come back to Nantucket, was appeared to have been even at Low Beach, went out to the shoals. And a couple of these could be questionable. I've, I've selected only the higher quality uh, uh, satellite uh, positions, but I suspect this is real and uh, is a trip up to New Bedford there. Finally, to towards the end, this is a bird that wintered in North Carolina. We had two birds go to North Carolina. One was in the Gulf Stream off Hatteras. This is, there's a garbage dump here, which I think the bird's hanging around at. But this is the last 20 days, and this bird is moving north over that whole time. So it was here on March 15th and started this northward pr progression. And we were thinking, Oh, this one's headed for Greenland now. And just 20 minutes before I started this talk, I looked it up and no, it's back. It's back over here in North Carolina again. This is an Albemarle Sound here. And here's the start of the Outer Banks. But uh, again, it looks like exploration, but it didn't like what it found or something and uh, came right back. One more, here's Staten Island here, the Raritan River. This is Round Valley Reservoir and um, uh, Spruce Run Reservoir. I'm deliberately not, I'm doing all of these um, maps on the same spatial scale so as not to distort things and to show you this bird is really sitting put in a very limited area. Um, I'm not sure what it, I, I would guess what it's doing is getting fed by people coming to the park here, both Round Valley and Spruce Run, get a lot of fishermen and people just uh, hacking around. And I guess that one is uh, taking human food. An another one from, this is the Delaware River. Um, th this is the uh, Pensbury Manor garbage dump here, which has huge numbers of lesser blackback gulls. It, it seems curious to me that none of the birds are going there. This is a much bigger dump than the Bethlehem, Pennsylvania one, but nevertheless, not, none of the birds went there. So what? There, I've just given you a bunch of uh, data on lesser blackback gulls, and I want to change... Um, direction a minute and go and uh, address this uh, so what sort of concept. <clears throat> These are my Arcus flycatchers from the Caribbean and they're seven or eight species. There's three species on Jamaica here, rufous-tailed flycatcher, uh, stolid and sad flycatchers. They're all found here. This, this one is La Sagra's flycatcher, which is in the Bahamas and Cuba. Uh, Puerto Rican flycatcher in Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, um, lesser Antillean flycatcher and Grenada flycatcher, all flycatchers in the same genus. How did this come to be? How are these different flycatchers all on these different islands? I've picked this particular example because, well, partly because we did all the work with ash throated flycatcher, but um, also. All of the Caribbean islands, except of the Bahamas, are volcanic, and they've been they've been in the same place that they are for the entire for as long as there have been Myarcus flycatchers around. In other words, they these islands weren't connected; they didn't break up by tectonic plate movement or anything else. They've the islands have been where they are. So why are there all these species? The reason there are is because vagrants from one or another population flew across the open water to these islands and colonized them. Why did that happen? Probably because of population growth on the island where they were. They were producing lots of babies. The babies got up and took off to new islands. And that's, um, people go sort of through, um, 
tie themselves in the knots to avoid saying the word vagrant here, but this is exactly what's going on and, and the same basic thing that we are talking about um, with lesser black back gulls. We had a, what I, to me, was sort of an extraordinary experience. This is going back to 2012 or something like that. <clears throat> This is the this is Puerto Rico, Vieques, the American Virgin Islands are here are here. This is a bird called Adelaide's warbler. They're sort of vaguely related to yellow-throated warbler. And in 2012, we were astonished to find an Adelaide. I'm, I'm amazed I knew what it was. I'd never seen one on St. John. And it, unbeknownst to us at the time, somebody else found them on St. Thomas. So in 2012, there were um, probably six or eight of these birds in the American Virgin Islands. Okay, it's only about 50 miles from Vieques, but they've never been recorded in the Virgin Islands, ever historically, never, never one individual. So <clears throat> the, the range of this bird is Puerto Rico, but basically almost all of them are on this island, Vieques. And I talked to the, there's actually a Vieques Christmas bird count. And I talked, uh, I'm spacing out her name right now, but I wrote to her and said, what, what, what have you been seeing on, on uh, Christmas counts on Vieques for Adelaide's Warbler? And here's a graph from 1996 to 2011, 2012. So at the peak, the highest population, at least that they're resident, they don't, they don't have a regular, they don't leave the island in the winter, put it that way. Uh, peak numbers in 2011 and immediately after that is, is when they colonized the Virgin Islands. So we, we actually witnessed a new colonization of a West Indian island um, right in front of us. I, I thought that was very impressive, but this is exactly um, what we argue in um wh why is vagrancy important well if birds are going to discover newly available habitats this is the way that they're going to do it one other tidbit by the way this the virgin islands are in the easterly trade wind so these birds are flying against the trade wind it always blows from the east here so these are you you can't argue that these are got blown by the wind up to the virgin islands they're active dispersal and exploration to find this new habitat <clears throat> that that's it and uh this is very much a group effort so it's um important that I acknowledge all these people. I think we had something like 20 people out there on the beach the first time we uh, set up that net, net. Uh, but all kinds of other people pitched in and helped. This, this is a big production. And I hope hope we keep it going, incidentally, where Lisa and I are, are working hard to uh, write a new proposal and try and uh, continue this uh, project into the future. But thanks for listening, and um, I, I am done, and uh, I'm glad, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Well, that was awesome, Dick. Thank you so much. Um, I loved hearing about that. Um, yeah, well, we can open up the floor for questions. I have a bunch, <laughs> but feel free to shout out. All right, I'll start us off. So it seems like the driving, um, I guess, force for this vagrancy is successful breeding seasons and breeding years in certain populations. Um, more birds, are, especially younger birds, are dispersing. So with populations of um, basically most bird species at this point um, crashing or declining rapidly. Do you think this is bad news for birds' um, ability to expand their range, especially in the face of, of changing climates? Um, yes, I think so, yeah. I mean, for um, you know, really, really endangered things like um, Kirtland's warbler, for example, I, I think they're in real trouble. 
um, because clearly their um, uh, their popula their habitat's going to be endangered by, by the change of climates. Maybe other nearby areas will become suitable, but yeah, things that are really rare and not producing yes. a lot of young, I would say that's definitely true. I, I should mention that um, a number of people, including my colleague Lisa Manna, thinks that um, there are also declining populations that generate vagrants. And the, the reason she and um, uh, 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 Lucinda Zawaski think that is that they've analyzed data on um, various birds in North America, and they have species that are declining that are generating vagrants. And I, um, I won't say they're wrong, but one the reason I showed the example of a scissor tailed flycatcher is there's a species that's declining, mm -hmm. but um, it, it's a scale dependent thing, even though the, the total number in North America is declining in parts of the range, they're increasing and they are producing substantial numbers of young. So I, 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 I'm not convinced. I, I think in those instances where it appears that declining species are generating vagrants, it's actually, there are pockets um, within their range that, that are actually growing. But uh, a, a good example, Swainson's warbler, um, there have been a, a number of Swainson's warblers in the Northeast recently. Now, that's a species I would never in my wildest dreams would think was increasing. And I, mm -hmm. But um, Schuyler had two on Tucker Knock one fall, which was a mind bug. But there have been a number. I mean, there have been like six of them in New York in the last couple of years. Um, but actually, the the coastal populations of Swainson's warbler are declining, but the in, more inland ones are, have been steadily increasing for 20 years. And it, you know, it's, a, it's an old growth forest species. And they, they require cane breaks, which are only in the most undisturbed forest, but they are. So that, uh, um, but it, it's a good, that's a good, a good question, and uh, I don't really know the answer, answer, but I suspect it has to do with if a species appears to be a de decreasing, I expect there are actually patches where they're increase, where they are, where they are doing well. But your basic question: if, if a species really is declining, is it going to adapt to climate change? I, I doubt it. Yeah. Well, I'll keep going if nobody has questions. What a wrap. All right. Um, so it kind of seems like the impetus for a lot of this exploration is is food, is looking for food so sources. Um, do you think there's anything else driving this exploration? Finding finding uh, breeding habitat. Mm -hmm. um, Right, pro probably mostly food, but um, you know, the, for lesser blackback gulls, the they the ones that made it to Iceland have been strongly selected for. Right, they mm -hmm. they wandered to Iceland, just sort of wandering around. They did spectacularly well once they got there. So, um, if there's a genetic component to the exploration behavior. <laughs> The, the ones that got there are going to be generating all the new young, and so they might be just prone to explore without, without a specific goal in mind, but they might um, just be wanderers by uh, disposition. Mm -hmm. and I was also curious about um, the different age classes. I'm assuming you were catching all sorts of ages of lesser black. Yeah, I, I, I meant to mention that we got, we had two first winter birds, two second winter birds, three third winter, and the rest were adults. And okay. then we, we intentionally, I mean, that's, 
I mean, we, we got 11 birds on all, so we, <laughs> we, we put um, trackers on all of them. We, we mm -hmm. couldn't pick and choose there. But we thought about that um, for a while in advance. And I mean, in a sense, the ones we're most interested in are the first year birds. Yeah. They're the, they're the more, most likely to explore. Mm -hmm. But they, they also have the highest mortality. Right. So, you know, it's a toss up between do you want to get the best data or do you want to lose your transmitter? Um, so, actually, we got the last day we did this, we got two yeah. first letter birds. Both were quite underweight. And we, we just thought these yeah. birds are, are not going to make it. And one, we didn't want to shoulder them with a transmitter. Two, we thought we'd probably lose it. So, we let mm -hmm. them go. We did put bands on them, so. We'll look out for them. So I'm curious about these New York birds. Were these younger birds? No. We, we, that, we made that prediction. We thought the long movement one. The, the one on Staten Island is a first winter bird. Mm -hmm. But um, overall, we, we did a uh, chi-squared mm -hmm. test to see if there, they were more likely to be young birds. And, um, the, they were, the, the adults and younger ones were equally likely to go to New York. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Which was a surprise. Uh, it, it's also a surprise because young, for lesser black back gulls, young birds go farther south in the winter than the adults. Mm. Okay. Our people don't be shy. <laughs> that was a great presentation, Dick. Thank you. Yeah, really nice. Great. Uh, the graphics were, were were really useful, clear, you know, related and surprising, impressive. Thank you. Glad you Tra had. the track the tracking. Uh, uh, it brings up so many questions about how do they know <laughs> that that destination is there when they set out. Now, granted, you're seeing the tracks of individual birds. It could have been a flock of 15 birds flying along, and one of them had the tracker on it, and the lead bird knew what he was doing. But even so, uh, it's, it's sort of bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to go out there to the continental slope and see what's going on. But uh, tough to get out there in the winter. I, as as an aside, I was once uh, I once watched Larry Niles do his uh, magic uh, with the with the nets down in uh, Delaware Bay with his his crew there, and uh, I was just observing. But then afterwards, uh, I had this little point and shoot camera, and afterwards I got to walk around with all the people who were doing the separation of the birds and then starting to do all the homework, taking a bird out of its, you know, out of where it's being kept and doing all the testing and measuring and stuff. And I've got a, a picture, somebody said, you wanna let this one go? It was a semi-palmated sandpiper. Mm -hmm. I said, hey Lanny, you wanna let this go? I said, sure. So I held my camera, you know, in one hand and I just had this great picture of this blurry semi-palm with a band on it flying out of my hand in a way that was like a high point because it went from observer to participant in a second you know it was, it was very very uh uh uplifting yeah i, I, I got i got uh canon that shorebirds with brian harrington a couple times way back in the in the 70s at uh third cliff situate we got we got a lot of birds each hall. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's um, well, there's nothing like it. <laughs> I guess I would say so. All the birds are freaked out. All the people are freaked out because they don't. Well, they don't want to get hurt, be in the nets any longer than they have to be. And some of those guys find their way out, so they don't want to lose any. And uh, <laughs> people with handfuls of little birds <laughs> uh, running. Running to put them in some covered 
burlap covered holding pen, you know. <laughs> yeah, how many uh, goals did you get in one cannon session? Um, what was the top? We got, we got 11 lesser blackbacks, but there were a number of Iceland goals. The great blackbacks, we just let them go. Mm -hmm. But we, there were probably like 20. Cool. So and, that's chaos. Um, but we we were really baffled because we, we did this for three days in December. We got absolutely squat. The birds would not. They 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 were terribly skittish, and they wouldn't. Um, uh, part of it we we had people standing on the beach. We got everyone off the beach later on. Got all the trucks off the beach. But even so, it was. Uh, we, we were putting out a bunch of bait and they came in and ate all they came and ate all the bait and left um so so finally we we put out a combination of the herring to attract them in and then the 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 scallop shells the herring they could just pick up a piece and fly away but the scallops they they sort of get their heads down in and mess around and they're trying to pull the shells off so they have to stay there longer and that's how we got that's how we got them but it was um but both he and i were just sort of baffled i mean these are seagulls how, how tough can this be but they're they yeah. are very very um sort of alert and skittish as to what's going on interesting <clears throat> so i'm just sort of curious about range expansion in general um the example of like the white wing dove you gave and just seeing from decade to decade what that looks like. I, I just I'm curious about how quickly range expansion can happen. I know it's dependent on a lot of different factors, but um, is there a certain standard, you know, it takes maybe 20 years to see an actual range expansion happen or, or can it be much shorter than that? Well, well, there are lots of data on that and and lots of lots of ways to model it and um uh, someone named brian kessel did that with starlings in north america and it, it was um a fairly crude analysis but it, it was it was mathematically crude crude but she had fantastic data and it's um it was published in uh the condor maybe but she she, she took 10 year 10 year interval intervals and showed how fast um, it took starlings to get all the way across North America, and there've been very detailed analyses on house finches, but th those are sort of easier because they're introduced, right? So there were zero to begin with, and they were all introduced to one place, and it's it's easy to map. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you, you can sort of predict it based on life history, you know, like how old they are when they first breed. I mean, birds that breed when they're one year old are going to be able to, the population is going to grow a lot faster than ones that don't breed till they're 10 years old, right? And then you have to combine that with sort of dispersal distance, which of course is the hardest thing to get. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say lesser blackback gulls have probably expanded as fast as just about anything else I can think of. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe cattle egrets are faster. Hmm. but um th there are there are a ton of data on that there it, it's fine it's people from very different um uh with very different backgrounds and very different interests have sort of converged on this but there, there are now whole there are whole scientific journals who deal deal with that issue though hmm. fascinating well, great. Any last minute questions before we sign off? All right. Well, Dick, thank you so much again. That was fantastic. Thank you for setting it up. Yeah. Uh, if, um, uh, yeah, and anybody wants more 